Hey everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dark Parade. My name is Bo, I am your host for these proceedings. And today we're going to do a little bit of a different kind of episode, but something I've, I've wanted to do for a little while. Uh, we don't have a typical regular schmegular movie uh, research episode, although one is coming soon. I've just got to uh, get all of that organized, and now that class is done... Uh, there is going to be a little bit more, hopefully, of a uh, you know regular schedule for all of that stuff. But that said, uh, I've wanted to do something like this, and this is kind of a review roundup episode, uh, looking at a handful of new movies, as well as, and this is another thing I've really wanted to do, uh, a look at a book. So, that's right, we're getting literary all up in this piece, as the children say. Uh, so... Um, let's begin with maybe the most anticipated movie of certainly the summer, I would think, for genre fans, and that is Jordan Peele's Nope. Uh, it is uh, a, a recent release, but uh, I, I'm, I guess I should put my Jordan Peele bona fides out there, which is I love Get Out. I really like Us. I, I think that Us has a problem with uh, the sort of the weight of the allegory ultimately crushing the human story being told in that film uh, and and gets uh, to the point where it strains credulity a bit. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I mean, this is all kind of, you know, high fantasy and dark fantasy and, and horror. So I don't begrudge a movie for having its own logic but when the logic seems to you know buckle under the weight of even a little bit of scrutiny like i think it does at the end of us uh you know it's just distracting uh, although i think that us is a good movie and i think it's uh filled with good performances and all of that so um that brings us to nope right the third film from jordan peele and as time has gone on because i saw a nope opening weekend and as time has worn on i think i like that movie more and more um as you know it opened the what july 22nd 21st and i saw it back then and i really like so much of nope and I think that I'm starting to come around a little bit more on the fact that Jordan Peele is is just not operating in the realm of, hey, this is going to be a traditional narrative that's going to have all the traditional satisfactions of a traditional narrative. And, you know, that's somewhat frustrating. And so let me take a step back before I get into that part. So Nope, of course, is about um, a a family that is broken because of the death of the father, played by Keith David, and it's, you know, uh, Daniel Kaluuya is uh, trying to essentially hold on to the family business, which is Hollywood horse rentals, Um, and his sister, Kiki Palmer, is a little bit more of what Joe versus the volcano would refer to as a flipperty gibbet. And, <laughs> uh, you know, th- th- it's a bit of a strained relationship where Daniel Kalua feels like he's kind of doing all the heavy lifting and Kiki Palmer is just kind of drifting in and out of, uh, the family as she chooses. And, uh, alongside that, you have the fact that Daniel Kalua is kind of slowly selling off all their horses to a local, uh, you know, roadside attraction as run by Steven Yun, who is a child actor who has sort of grown up to run this place. And honestly, his storyline is maybe my favorite. And I, I think part of the thing that I get frustrated by when watching Nope is that some of these storylines don't resolve themselves in the most satisfying of ways. Uh, in that way, it's probably a bit more, you know, realistic in a lot of ways. But, um, and then kind of in the in the wings is Michael Wincott, who is a cinematographer 
who seems largely checked out of the industry that, you know, there's just not that much left for him to shoot. He's been doing it for years and years and into their lives uh, all comes this phenomenon that they see in the sky. You know, it, it's sort of a question mark of what is this? Is it an alien or aliens uh, invading? Are they trying to, you know, suck people up and kidnap them and so forth? And, you know, I'm going to obviously leave the story of what uh, the nope um, surprise is because, you know, it, it's one of those movies that trades on um, the, the not just the surprise, but sort of what that means. And so I'll leave it at that. But there is a lot of discussion within the film about predators and prey and... Um, more importantly though, the thing that Jordan Peele seems to be getting at is the idea of black filmmakers and creating something that is co-opted by, you know, popular white culture or just popular culture in general, kind of taking some of the things away from black, uh, filmmakers and black creatives and, and co-opting it as, as part of just the general public without perhaps giving credit where it's due. And, um, you know, I've seen some critical analysis that says that in a lot of ways, this is Jordan Peele commenting on what it is like to get a movie made as a black filmmaker and the worries of, you know, is this being watched the right way? Is this being taken the right way? Um, you know, that was a big problem with the Chappelle show. So the reason he quit doing it was because, you know, he started to really question himself about whether, you know, what he was laughing at or what, what he thought the joke was, is that what everyone else thought the joke was or was, you know, a lot of the material on the Chappelle show being taken at face value and ultimately, not helping the cause of what he felt was the role of, you know, black comedians and so forth. And so, um, you know, it, it, it's an interesting discussion. Like one of the things that you can count on Jordan Peele for is Jordan Peele is going to give you a movie that has a lot to chew on and Nope is no different. Uh, my big concern coming out of Nope or, or the problem I had coming out of Nope, Nope, I think was that a lot of the side characters, don't seem to resolve their stories in a way that I kind of wanted to see. Um, you know, whether it is, uh, you know, Brandon, uh, Perea's character, uh, Steven Yeun's character, Michael Wincott's character, a lot of those seem to kind of fall by the wayside. And in fairness, those are side characters, Daniel Kalu and Kiki Palmer are the, the, uh, main performers and where the focus of the film lies. And that does resolve in a way that I think is very good. But a, a lot of the side characters, I, I wish there had been a little more meat so that when, you know, they, those characters find their path to the end of the film or the end of their stories within the film that I, I felt like I was getting a little more out of that. Um, but that's kind of a, a, a small complaint ultimately when, you know, Jordan Peele is a, a, an incredibly interesting director and I always look forward to what he's going to do. I'm still looking forward to what he does next. And I, as, as time goes on and I need to revisit us, I think, I, I think the lesson I take from Nope is I need to go back to us and see if I'm still bothered by the same, you know, kind of fiddly, uh, inconsistencies are not even inconsistencies. It's just the strain of logic of, well, if this is what the story is and there are all these doubles and so forth, then what, what about this? And what about this? And what does hands across America have to do with all of this? And, um, I, I should go back and revisit that. You know, I, I thought about this with Nope as well. I just need to listen to the director's commentary and maybe that is a fault of the film is that I now feel like I need to listen to Jordan Peele talk about what his perspective is in making some of the choices he did. And I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing, but also it doesn't make the movie going experience entirely satisfying for me. And that's what I keep coming back to, right? Is just keep 
I, I keep bringing up how satisfied I am with the narrative experience. And I don't know that his movies are so, you know, highly allegorical, like uh, something like a, a Yodorovsky film or even a Jarmusch film or, or something like that, where you can kind of ignore the fact that there are all these unresolved threads or that less attention is paid to those threads than if he was a more esoteric kind of filmmaker because there is a popcorn entertainment kind of vibe to his movie still, but there's also this high mindedness. And sometimes I think those two things don't sit as comfortably alongside one another as you might like. Um, so that's, that's no, but uh, if you ask me, it, you know, on a scale of one to five, I gave it a three and a half on letterboxd, uh, where you can follow me. If you want to follow what I am watching, you can go to Borilla on letterboxd. That is me. Uh, just my name, B O with Rilla as, uh, or gorilla with a B instead of a G that'll help too. So I, I do think Nope is very good. Um, I'm not quite at the point where I think it's great, I, but it's also a movie I would like to go back and revisit and, and perhaps my view of it will change because over time, as I've thought more and more about it, um, i I think I've enjoyed it more than I did initially. So, you know, take that as you will. But I do think it's good. And if you haven't seen Nope, I do think it's worth your time. And if you have thoughts on it uh, about the, you know, sort of subtext of the film, uh, which is pretty overt. It's more text than subtext, I would argue. But, um, you know, yeah, drop me a line on Discord and we'll we'll chat about it. We actually talked a little bit about it on Discord already. So uh, if you're not on the Discord channel where all that's happening, by the way, you can go to legionpodcasts.com forward slash the dash dark dash parade and uh yeah and feel free to drop in on the chat there and you know uh let us know what uh what you thought so let's let's move on to our second film which is of the three we are going to talk about it is the one that is the most disappointing i guess but uh the movie is allegoria Directed by Spider One of Power Man, is it Power Man Five Thousand? I do believe, um, and uh, yeah, Power Man Five Thousand. I had to double check my math on that. So this is the brother of Rob Zombie, and he has written and directed a movie that is all about artistic expression, and it's sort of an anthology horror film. And with anthology horror films, it's always a mixed bag, right? Um, and I'm going to sound probably particularly vicious uh, in this review. And I really do try to find the good in things. But I found my time with Allegoria to be really irritating. I think this is a movie that thinks it's about ten times smarter than it really is. I think I told somebody that Allegoria is a a movie that will make dumb people feel smart because it is talking about the creative uh, expression and artistic endeavors and, and the terrors of that and so forth, but it's just kind of dopey. Um, you know, there's a, a handful of stories. One is about an acting class uh, and it's sort of the framing de device of the film of uh, this, you know, acting teacher who is demanding people, find their inner monster and you can kind of guess how that's going to go. And then there's, uh, another one that features, uh, scout Taylor Compton. I think she's just scout Compton is how she's credited in this film. And, uh, it's a, a first date between her and, um, a guy who's a little bit awkward and nerdy. And it turns out that she, uh, has, created some crazy art and he's like oh this almost looks real and i think you can see where that goes and there's uh another one that is uh about a guy who thinks he has in has discovered six notes that can summon evil and that leads into the wraparound and look i am all for doing a, a movie as, as someone who works in creative arts to some degree on a fairly regular basis, uh, being creative and the, the demons that go along with that, um, 
both, you know, the, the self doubt and the struggle, you know, as a writer looking at the blank page, sometimes it's terrifying. Sometimes it's, it's great. Sometimes it's an elating experience. Uh, and, and the act of creation is really wonderful, but sometimes it's really tough. You know, sometimes it, it is, uh, not just a struggle, but it leads to some pretty dark thoughts about, you know, what you are and what you are capable of. And there is plenty of room to tease that out into, you know, a horror story. Oh, and before I forget there, one of the segments involves a painter who may be painting, uh, this monster. Um, there's another one that's about a screenwriter writing a movie about a, a serial killer who surprise, surprise shows up to give him notes on it. And none of it comes off. Like that's the thing with this movie is that no individual story ever succeeds on its own merit. And the piece as a whole, like the movie itself is only hour, 10 minutes, hour, 15 minutes. Like it's a quick watch. But even in that quick watch, I was so bored to tears by the end of it. There is nothing creative about it. it it's, it, it is as if, uh, like a twilight zone or EC comics kind of twist ending sort of, you know, horror story was dropped into the hands of someone who had absolutely nothing new to say about any of this. And I think that's the big problem is that it's not particularly scary. It's not particularly interesting. The, you know, subtext of what it is saying about, you know, creativity or, or artistic struggle or, or whatever doesn't really matter. The, you know, hearing the speech that the acting teacher gives at the front end of this movie about what he wants and you know forget all this crap I, I need you to be real and raw and it, that was the point where I started to worry and then when it got into the segment about the painter who was constantly arguing with the jackal of the guy who just didn't understand that he's trying to create and the fact that this guy wants him to wants him to uh, draw or paint commercial work um, so that he can get paid for his efforts. You know, there, there's part of me that just finds that sort of, you know, eth uh, somewhat elevated attitude for artists. Like, I think there is a place for the artist that doesn't want to make compromises, right? I've, there are lines in the sand that I've drawn with my work from time to time um, where I've said, look, I just don't, I don't think that this screenplay, for example, needs the the scene that you are proposing and I don't want to write it. Um, you know, I understand those, uh, those struggles, but most of art, commercial art at least is all about compromise. It's a, Hey, this is the, the hill I'm willing to die on, but here are the other things that I'm willing to do to actually make a living at what I'm doing. Um, there are very few pure artists who just get to spill their brain onto the page or canvas or whatever, or the stage and just have that be what you see. And in a lot of cases, it's it's for the better that you have someone that's trying to shape the, the art into something that's more commercially digestible so more people get access to it. And, you know, th this is, of course, accepting things like, you know, Citizen Kane should not have a lot of corporate interference. Like, that is a gorgeous movie and, and stands on its own. You don't want somebody filtering the creative energies of you know, Van Gogh, even though it may be, that would be for the best uh, some, uh, uh, anti-psychotics probably would have done that guy some good. But despite all of that, you know, the, there is something about a, uh, somebody like spider one, meaning, you know, uh, the front man for a band who clearly is a horror fan, not saying that dipping his toes into the world of filmmaking and just feeding lines into the mouths of these, you know, artistic characters in the film that are just so high school grandiose uh, of, of, you know, giving their finger to the man. And it's just dumb. It's It doesn't feel authentic. It doesn't feel like it's saying anything. It's not getting to some deeper universal truth about the artistic experience. It's just a dopey movie and, and it's dull 
and it's uninspired and it's one of those shutter exclusives that comes along and i understand why they picked it up right this is rob zombie's brother making a horror movie there is a it's the reason i watch it i was at least curious about this and so it makes sense for them to showcase this movie as a way to get subscribers or viewers etc cetera, etc cetera. but it's just so dumb um, and I, I, on a scale of one to five, I give this a solid one star because it is at least mostly technically competent. Although there are times where even that is not completely true, um, where I don't think that it succeeds in, uh, uh, being just a, a, a decent movie to look at with your eyeballs, but mm, it's, it's a rough one. So again, hop over the Discord uh, if you've seen Allegoria and need to either vent your spleen, or uh, if you want to defend the movie, I'm interested in that. I'm interested in, and in, you know, somebody out there had to have liked this movie. It's just hard for me to imagine that being the case. Uh, so if you did, let me know. Let me know what you liked about it. Uh, I'm not going to tell anyone that they are wrong for liking a movie unless that person is Jamie Sammons. And the movie is the uh, Night the Nightmare on Elm Street remake, but otherwise, I am pretty accepting of most people and their, you know, their enjoyment of any film. So, well, this is coming from the guy that wrote Lost After Dark, right? So, you know, you like what you like, that's cool. Uh, but I really had a rough time with Allegoria. So let's end our discussion of this trifecta of films on a much better note. And that is to talk about Dan Trachtenberg's Prey, which is the straight to Hulu prequel or at least entry into the Predator franchise and uh, set in the, the year 1719, I do believe. And um, so it, it what I like about this movie is that it goes far enough back in time that you're not worried about what the Predator movies of the modern age have done, you know, starting with the the Arnold Schwarzenegger Predator film and Predator 2 and Predators and The Predator and all that stuff. None of that matters other than you are dealing with a Predator, right? And so Prey concerns itself. Uh, uh, Amber Midthunder is the, the actor's name who is the lead. And she is um, Naru, and Naru is uh, trying to be accepted in her tribe as a hunter, but she's a little bit timid still. Like there, she's she's reticent to um, to kill. Uh, she doesn't have that that kind of savagery that some of the other members of the tribe have, the other hunters. But she's very talented. She's an incredible tracker. Um, and along with her dog, uh, who is a, a wonderful, you know, kind of side character, um, she basically goes out to prove herself that she is going to be recognized as a hunter. And the thing that the, that is interesting about the movie is that it not only deals with Nehru and her journey through the film to, you know, sort of find that inner well of strength. Uh, to match her cleverness, like she she has cleverness for days, but perhaps not the intestinal fortitude um, to go through. Like she doesn't necessarily possess that kind of hardness, that that sort of steel that some of the other people in the tribe do, and and so following her through that journey. But in addition to that, there is uh, some commentary about the encroachment of you know, the European nations on the continent at the time and the wastefulness of that. There's a, a much like in Nope, although certainly I think more pointedly in Prey, there is a, a discussion of who is the predator and who is the prey. Um, whether that is, you know, as, as you see these French uh, sort of, in, you know, encroaching into the world of the Native American tribes and their, you know, slaughter of buffalo and there's, you know, imagery. The one scene in particular involves like, oh, here is 
the lowliest of creatures being eaten by this creature, which is eaten by this creature, which is eaten by this creature. And, you know, here is the food chain. Here is the, the order of things. And how do you sort of break out of that? Or if not break out of it, how do you, how do you assert yourself um, in, in a world where, you know, everything is kind of dangerous to some degree or another? And uh, so all of that stuff is, is at work in the subtext of Prey. But the straightforward story of the film Prey is just, hey, all of a sudden a predator has come to town uh, to, to do its hunting, as, as we know they are wont to do. And it's, you know, it, it, it goes after Nehru and members of her tribe, and she ultimately has to defend herself against this creature that is dealing with highly technological, like, you know, it's got the tools of the predator. And, um, you know, as she says in the movie, one of my favorite moments in the film is when she tells, um, you know, I can't remember if it's her, her brother. I should have taken notes on that, but at, at the very least, uh, the, the young man that she is closest with, I think it is her brother. Um, and she says, look, you know, you're, you might be a better hunter or a stronger hunter, but I, I know things like I can figure things out. I'm, I'm more clever and that is her strength. And that is ultimately how she, you know, by piecing together, even though she doesn't understand the technology at work, but by understanding, oh, this means this, and you can kind of follow her character in understanding how to, you know, try to escape this predator or to defeat this predator, um, using her understanding rudimentary as it is of the predator's own tools. And it's really fun. The, the big complaint, and I am not the first, uh, person to mention this. I've seen a couple of complaints about this as well, but the, the CGI used for some of the animals is not great. There is a bear in particular, that sequence with the bear, it just doesn't look great. And yeah, it, it, it's kind of an, a minor issue I have with the movie, but again, it kind of takes me out of the film when I'm noticing how cartoony the bear looks. Um, fortunately, the movie doesn't, once it gets through some of those initial CGI animals in the first half, eh, 30, 40 minutes, then it, it kind of puts all that behind it. And there are a lot of practical effects in the film. It's as gruesome as you want it to be. There, there are some pretty gnarly kills in it. Uh, it gets brutal for sure. You know, this is a world in which the flintlock pistol is the height of technology and seeing that stuff used, uh, was a lot of fun. It, it's really an interesting movie. I like the idea of how do you defeat something that is so technologically advanced, but is also on your ground. And that's, you know, ultimately where uh, Prey kind of shines is is in the struggle to defeat a thing that is bigger than you, stronger than you, smarter than you, in theory, and in technologically advanced. And how do you defeat that using only what you have at your disposal? And so all of that stuff is really good. There are a couple of uh, sort of tentpole sequences in the movie. One that it kind of mirrors the Predator shredding through this uh, uh, camp of French furriers and also uh, a similar scene where you see Naru fighting a bunch of these uh, trappers as well. And it, it's really good. They're fun sequences. They're, they're creative. Uh, they're kind of nasty at times and in, in the best possible way. And I found my time with Prey to be very good. I, I, I think this is a four out of five movie. Um, it's not maybe an instant classic or anything, but it's, it's a wonderfully entertaining movie. It, it moves at a, a nice clip. I think it's about 90 minutes long and it, it rocks, you know, it, it really moves. Um, the fact that it has a predominantly native American cast and that you can watch the movie in Comanche, um, with American or American with English subtitles. And I think that's kind of an interesting choice. It's, it's really fun. This is a really, really fun movie. Uh, 
you know, I've seen a couple of people say, like, of all the movies that have come out recently, I wish this had been in the theater because it would have been a great theater experience. And, and questioning whether the fact that this did go through the streaming services, does it sort of diminish what the movie is? And I don't necessarily agree with that. I, I kind of wrap my head around the fact that, you know, some movies are going to be straight to streaming platforms and some of those movies win Oscars, you know? Um, there have been uh, examples of that already. And, I, I, you know, do I think Prey's going to win an Oscar? No, 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 of course not. But I don't think it delegitimizes the movie to have, you know, premiered on Hulu. Um, and because it's a smaller movie, I don't think that this was a giant budget. Uh, it's a fairly intimate film, uh, as it goes. And I, I'm willing to accept that these are the kind, you know, if we get more like prey on the streaming services rather than allegoria, I'm a happy guy. Like, I, I don't know exactly what the movie cost. Probably not as much as if a studio was like, hey, we are going to put a Predator movie in the theaters and we're going to spend $100 million to make it and it's going to be um, an event kind of picture. You know, we're going to try to marvel this up or whatever. That's fine. J make this movie for $60, $70 million, whatever it costs to make it um, and and let it, you know, gain a head of steam. Like, most of the reactions to the movie uh that i have seen are are very positive and and i think that's right I, th I think it's a very good movie i think it's a lot of fun it 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 does what a predator movie ought to do which is make the predator intimidating and kind of scary um put our heroes at a disadvantage and then allow them to you know sort of reason and and creatively manufacture situations to get out of under the the thumb of this predator who is you know by all accounts um unstoppable and you know there's some very fun stuff in it there's uh like i said some good gore uh it's just a good time if you haven't seen prey you know and it's on hulu get yourself a uh uh you know one of them um you know, trial period, seven, seven day trials for Hulu and, and enjoy it. Uh, or if you're already a Hulu subscriber, then you've probably already seen it. If you haven't already seen it, you ought to, um, you know, I was talking to court on the discord and he was saying that he was basically going to fire this thing up in his home theater. And if you are lucky enough to have, you know, some space with a big screen and some good sound, it is worth locking yourself away with this movie for 90 minutes and, and letting it happen to you. Cause it's a, it's a good time. Okay. So enough, I think about the movies, let us turn our attention then to, um, uh, a, a, a book. Um, and I've wanted to get literary with the dark parade for some time. And, uh, I gotta say, here's the, the one upside I think of being back in school is that it has sort of rekindled my love of reading stuff for the sheer pleasure of it. And, uh, I, so I, as a result, you know, after school ended, uh, I, I started looking around like, Hey, I want to read a good horror novel and you know did, did did some searching around the internet for the best horror novels that came out in the past 10 15 years or so and um what uh appealed to me was a, a book called dead silence written by s.a barnes who is also written under the the pseudonym stacy cade and um so here's the premise stop me if you've heard this before there is a luxury liner only it's in space and this luxury liner in space goes out on its inaugural trip is basically doing a tour of the solar system with uh influencers and uh the hoi polloi of society the rich and the and the wealthy and the fabulous and at some somewhere along the way 
there is a problem, they lose communication with the ship, and then it just disappears. So, uh, enter several years later, a, uh, a, a young team leader, not quite a captain, a team leader named Claire Kovalik and her team of, you know, scrappy space mechanics who basically work along the fringe of the solar system to repair comlink satellites and make sure that communication can happen within the solar system. They pick up a signal from this uh, derelict spaceship and decide, hey, let's go check it out. And then they discover that it is, in fact, the Aurora, this, this missing space cruise liner. And uh, they decide that they are going to investigate it because if it is, in fact, the Aurora and sort of naval rules apply, then they get the salvage rights. So they're going to go to the ship, get some items that prove that they discovered the real deal Aurora, which is now a, a ship that is uh, living in infamy and go back to earth, sell off the stuff that they took from the Aurora for a great deal of money and, uh, you know, live a life of wealth and, and ease. Well, of course they get on the ship and the, uh, the ship is full of ghosts. Uh, and, uh, you know, so it is in that way, very event horizon, you know, it is a, a, a group of ne'er do well space folk space pirates space truckers getting on board this ship and discovering that there seems to be something supernatural afoot that is driving everybody crazy and they find that everybody that was on the aurora has either killed themselves or each other and so that is the premise of the book again i will not go so far as to spoil any of the happenings although in telling you my complaint of the book then uh, I think you'll maybe divine some things about the plot. So I apologize if you don't want to uh, listen any further. By all means, you can stop right here if you're interested in the, the premise of the book. I will say that for me, it was about a three and a half star book out of five. Um, it is a good beach read. It is an easy read. There is not any, you know... Uh, the, the language is not elaborate. The language is not flowery. It is not reading the, the work of, uh, you know, an artist who is there to challenge you as a reader um, and make you think in, in different ways and understand language in different ways. No, 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 no. This is just an easy peasy beach read. And on that level, it totally works. I had a good time reading it. I rocketed through it. I read it in three or four days. Um, and on, on that level, it was fine. It, it is a totally acceptable, uh, beach read. Here is my problem with the book. And this is where the spoilers will, will begin. My problem with the book as a whole is that it presents itself as being a book about the supernatural. At a certain point, you come to understand that the the cause of all these hallucinations and so forth is not actually supernatural. And like I said, you you can probably divine sort of what's going on if you read the book from that. So apologies. Uh, you were warned about spoilers and there you have it. Um, but the, I felt like the rug had been pulled out from under me as I was reading dead silence that I was really into it uh, because I love event horizon and I love, uh, the idea of a haunted spaceship, I, I still can't believe that more books and movies do not revolve around this idea. And so maybe my disappointment in the book is more about me than the book itself, because the left turn that it takes to sort of explain what's going on on this ship isn't wrong. And it, and it fulfills the theme of the book, which um, is very alien like in the sense of, you know, hey, here are these big space corporations and sometimes they're trying to crawl at each other and as a result, people die in the in the midst of that. And that all works within the context of the book and, and it makes sense within the context of the book. I just didn't want it to be a normal explanation. You know, in some ways, I would have been fine if there had been no explanation. 
Um, I don't. Maybe I, maybe I wouldn't have. It's tough to say. Like, how do you prove a negative, right? Uh, but I I would have enjoyed reading a book that was about a haunted spaceship, and that's ultimately not what it's about. And that was kind of a a, a real kick in the pants for me. I I really uh, felt like I had been bamboozled to some degree. So this is another great example of my expectations of the book, but it all, all right. Also so much of the book leans into that, that when you get the, the real explanation of here's what's really happening, then how on earth do you not feel slightly disappointed to learn that this isn't the spooky ghost story that you thought you were reading? Um, that it's a much more mundane kind of explanation. And, and again, I can see the argument of, well, that's sort of the point is that, you know, the mundanity of evil and the, the fact that this isn't some grand supernatural thing, that this is more, you know, uh, a, a little bit and, and, and sadly, uh, more terrestrial, a, a problem than, you know, something like a haunted ship that, went afoul of some pocket of the universe and came back wrong or something uh, like you saw with Event Horizon. And, and I think that's just what I wanted. I wanted Event Horizon the book, and that's not what Dead Silence is, even though it has a lot of those same trappings. Um, would I recommend it? I mean, if you want... If, if the idea of it not ultimately being supernatural is okay with you, um, then yeah, it's it, like I said, it's a super breezy read. It is not, uh, it's not a challenging read or anything like that. And, uh, and it was good. It was good. I had a good time with it. I just wish it had been a little bit, I, I wish I had met my expectations a bit more rather than, um, you know, doing its own thing. And that, that it, that's such a, a terrible thing to say about a book is like, I wanted the book to be what I wanted the book to be and not what it was. Uh, it, it is a problem I have even with films of, you know, like, well, that's not the way I would have done it. And that's not the thing that makes me happy. But as a person kind of reviewing the book, um, that was my problem with it is that I, I wanted one thing out of the book. It took a left turn on me and became a different thing that could be to the the book's credit to some people to me it was a disappointment um still you know for a 300 ish page book it was a good time uh if you were going on vacation this late summer uh or into the fall and you want something that is going to be a fun read that silence was fun it's a good time it it as i was reading i was like oh i can totally see this movie i don't think it was written with you know, selling the movie rights in mind. But if I saw this movie, I would totally understand what, you know, the, the, this is a very cinematic kind of novel. Um, and later, uh, I hope to give you a review of a book called tender is the flesh, which is, uh, the current read along with some other stuff, um, that I plan to read in very short order. But, uh, yeah. So dead silence, eh, like I said, three and a half stars, it's good. Uh, I was kind of bummed that it wasn't uh, a horror book at, at the end of the day. It was more, you know, science fiction, corporate espionage than it was horror. But, eh, what are you going to do? Um, I'll tell you what I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap up this here episode. And I hope you enjoyed it. I, I really wanted to do something like this where it's just sort of, hey, let's talk about some recent releases. Uh, you know, we talk about old movies all the time on the main episodes. And I wanted to talk about some stuff that was a little bit newer and and be able to kind of give you a fresh take uh, or my take on, on some recent releases as well as to start to slide into some literary stuff. Uh, so I hope to do more of that in the future. Uh, as I said, it, uh, my love of reading has sort of been rekindled. Uh, recently, because for a long time there, uh, while I was doing the summer classes, I was required to read a bunch and I found myself enjoying that process, but not so much the material. And so now I have, uh, I have taken to pretty regularly, uh, taking, you know, an hour out of my day and just kicking back and reading something. And that's been a real treat. So, uh, I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, or even if you didn't, let me know. Like I said, hit me up on the Discord. 
Uh, you can find that over on uh, legionpodcasts.com forward slash the dash dark dash parade. Uh, there you can also find links to the uh, Twitter uh, and Facebook group. And so you can leave me messages there because I, I check those generally once a day, uh, if not more. And uh, But Discord I'm on just about all the time. So if you uh, jump on Discord and... Uh, drop me a line let me know what you thought of the review show as a concept and if you agree or disagree with any of the stuff we've talked about here I would love to hear it um, also coming up very soon uh, more Heart of War more What You Watch and we are going to honest to God get back to doing uh, some main movie reviews and, and having guests on and that kind of thing uh, but it's been enjoyable to just do these sort of solo episodes and, and, and talk about movies and, and books and all kinds of stuff uh, in a more direct one-on-one -on -one kind of way. So I hope you've enjoyed it as well. And uh, anyway, that's it for this time around. We've got more stuff coming next week. And in the meantime, thank you as always for joining the Dark Parade. We'll see you next week. <laughs>